Thank you, Robin. What a beautiful voice. Wow. If I could sing like that, I would just sing all the time. <laughs> Whoa, and part of thank you, that was wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, Joshua and Jacob, are you all going to leave now? We're going to go to Papa's church. Oh, okay, good. Well, we're glad y'all came today, okay? All right, bye-bye. See you next time. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you next time. Congratulations. <laughs> Well, I'm delighted to be with you again. Uh, uh, you all always do such a wonderful job of making me feel so welcome here, and I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, my wife, Nelda, is here, and my daughter, Christy, is here, and uh, uh, they both have visited before. Christy doesn't often get a chance. She works on Sundays most of the time. She doesn't often get a chance to, to come to church, but interestingly enough, the few times that she has, uh, one of them has been here as well. So. Well, we're delighted to have them, and I know many of you have met them and, and have made them feel welcome. If you're a guest today, we're happy that you're here as well. I'm a guest too, so I know what it feels like, okay? But we're happy that you're here. We've been doing a, a, a four-story series in the Word of God. We had two stories last week, and then we're going to have two today, one this morning and one at 6 o'clock this evening. All of these stories have taken place at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And the, the reason that, that God gave us these stories was so that we could sort of have an understanding of what God was about or what Jesus was all about. Uh, we know that the, the first story that we heard last week was about his baptism. And uh, we know that John the Baptist was busy. He was calling the people to repentance. He was calling the nation of Israel to repentance, that he was saying that God's time is now, the time of your deliverance is now. And John the Baptist, while he was baptizing at the River Jordan, had this awesome experience when Jesus came down to the River Jordan to be baptized by John. And John said, I, I can't baptize you, you need to be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, John, it, it, is, it is God's will, it is the fulfillment of righteousness that you baptize me. So John took Jesus down into the, into the river Jordan, and he baptized him, and Jesus walked back up out of the water. And remember the story, the heavens opened up, and the, the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came down and lighted on Jesus. And a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. He makes me so proud. And I love that story. Uh, just a, a few more little nuggets of truth in the story that, uh, that we didn't talk about last week. Uh, baptism is so important. Uh, we, are, we are Baptists because we believe that one of the first things that we can do after we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior is to follow the example that he set for us in what we call believer's baptism. Now, Jesus didn't need to be baptized to have all righteousness. We don't need to be baptized to have Jesus in our life and, and complete righteousness in him. But he does want us, after we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to show an example to those around us by saying, that many, many times for a new Christian, this is their first opportunity to share with the world what Jesus has done, and that is to follow his example by being baptized in, into water. And uh, also, I heard something this week that was pretty nifty, too. Not only does this show an example of what, ha what has happened in our lives, it tells a story, if you please, of what's happened in our lives, but also it allows us to, to become part of the group, part of the followers of Christ, and then we all begin on a journey together follow Christ. Last Sunday evening we heard the story that after Jesus was baptized, he was, he, was, he was filled with the Spirit of God. It was such an awesome experience for him to, to have God's Spirit come on him and hear God speak about him. And so the, the Spirit of God led Jesus out into the, into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And after he'd been there for 40 days, he was, he hadn't had anything to eat. 
He was starving to death. He was so hungry. And Satan came to him and said to him, If you're the Son of God, tell those stones over there to become bread. And Jesus said to him, It is written in the Scripture that man shall not live by bread alone. And then Satan, as a, as a second temptation, Satan took him up to a high place and let him see all of the great kingdoms of the world. And, he, and, and Satan said to Jesus, all of the power and splendor and authority of, of all of these great kingdoms of the world, all of these have been given to me and I can give them to anybody I want to. You can have them, Jesus, if you'll just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone should you serve. And then for the third temptation, Jesus took, uh, Satan took Jesus up to the, to the high point of the temple in Jerusalem. And he told him, Jump! And then Satan quoted a verse of scripture. He said, because it's, it's written in the Bible that God has given his angels charge over you to protect you. And, and you're not going to get hurt because the angels are going to catch you in their hands and lower you to the ground. You won't even bruise your foot. And Jesus said to Satan, It is written. It is written. You are not to tempt the Lord your God. Satan left Jesus at that time. And, and, and Luke tells us at that point that he, he left knowing that he was planning to come back at another opportune time and try to trip up Jesus. The stories continue. Jesus left from there, and let me give you a little intermediate information. Um, Jesus left that, that place of temptation and during, uh, during the time before the next story that we want to have this morning, he basically uh, was recruiting disciples at this time. Uh, a bit later, he went back before John the Baptist, who was proclaiming the kingdom, and John said, Behold this man. He, this is the one who has come. This is the Lamb of God. This is the one. And, and a couple of uh, John's disciples followed Jesus. Uh, and all of this happened. By the way, let me give you a quick geography lesson. Okay, most of you know this. But the, the, the Holy Land, the time of uh, the, uh, Palestine or, or the land of, of, uh, that God had promised, uh, the Holy Land during the time of Christ was divided into three sections. The first part up at the top was Galilee. And Galilee was where Nazareth was. Our story is going to take place up in Galilee this morning. But Galilee was the northern part where Nazareth is, and Capernaum and the Sea of Galilee is up here as well. And then the lower part was Judah, where Jerusalem was. And then sandwiched in between the two was Samaria, where literally the hated and despised Samaritans lived. And so Jesus was baptized down in Judah by the River Jordan, uh, let's see, James, let's see, Andrew, Peter, James, and John begin to follow Jesus down there. And then he, he and his disciples made a trip up to Galilee for the story that we're going to have today. Up there, he, uh, he talked to Philip, who became a disciple. Then he talked to Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel was from a town called Cana. And, and Cana was about uh, six or eight miles from Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. So it was just a, uh, did we say it before, it was, some of you all were raised in towns, you had one traffic light maybe, you know, maybe one service station. That was what, Cana was a one light town, how's that? that that's, Cana was just a very small village as well. Nathaniel, one of the disciples, was from Cana. And the story, and it, it comes to us from the second chapter of the book of John, if you want to look, and it begins with verse 1. But I'm going to tell you the story anyway, okay? So this is what John tells us for this third event that Jesus 
presents to us in his early ministry. That three days after he had asked Nathaniel to become a disciple, this is in the second chapter of John, three days after he asked Nathaniel to become a disciple, uh, he and his, there was a wedding in Cana. And so Jesus' mother was at that wedding. And Jesus and his disciples were invited, and they went to the wedding as well. After they got there, they ran out of wine. And Jesus' mother went to Jesus and said, they've run out of wine. And Jesus said to her, what does this concern of yours have to do with me, woman? My time hasn't come yet. And then Mary, Jesus' mother, she told the servants, she said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. There were six water jugs. They held about 20 or 30 gallons each. Six water jugs there that had water in them that were used for purification. Jesus told the servants, uh, fill those water jugs. So the servants went to the well and took the water and they filled those six jugs to the brim. And then Jesus said, draw out some water and take it to the chief servant. And so they drew the water out, they took it to the chief servant and when he tasted it, it was wonderful wine. And, and he didn't know where it came from, but the servants did. They knew what had happened. And so the chief servant went to the groom and said, Whoa, you know everybody else, they served the best wine at the beginning, and then as the, as the, the wedding uh, celebration comes, comes on, Eventually, they bring out, the, you know, a little bit worse stuff. <laughs> yeah. Freudian slip, worse stuff, yeah. But you've saved the, the best wine for last. Then, John tells us this. John says, this was the first miracle that Jesus did, and he did it in Cana. And the verse that we'll eventually get to that I want to drill that into a little bit, the phrase is, he displayed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Amen. And that's the story from the Word of God. All right, now, let's take a look at it. Let's see some of the things that were going on. We know that, that weddings were a big event in, in that day. In, in Little Cana, it, probably everybody from town came to it. Uh, you know, the, it, it, it was such a big event that more often than not, the wedding celebration, the whole event, now the, the wedding itself would take place on the first day, but, but the celebration could go on easily, most of the time for one week, sometimes for two weeks. People would come and go, People would eat, they would, they would fellowship. It became a great social event, a great time of celebration. And so this wedding occurred in Cana. And, and, and so we're told that Mary was there, and some think that uh, there may have been some, this may have been some kinfolks, that, that, and Mary may have been involved more than just a participant or just a, a visitor, that she may have sort of been assisting the, the chief servant in doing things. Uh, we're not particularly sure what happened, but, but we do know that, uh, uh, that Jesus and his disciples went to the wedding. Now, we have no idea of the timetable, but we do know that sometime during the time of that wedding, they ran out of wine. Now, this was a major, a major uh, social mistake or I'll use a real fancy word to impress you all, it was a major faux pas. How's that? Like that? Yeah. 
I don't get to use that word very often. I do it a lot, but I don't use the word a lot. This, 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 was, this was a serious mistake. And uh, Mary spotted the problem. We don't know that others at the wedding knew it, uh, uh, but uh, she spotted the problem, and she did something very interesting. She went, in, she went to Jesus, and she said to him, uh, Son, they've run out of wine. And it, we don't know why, we don't have all the dynamics there, but I think she, she well, mothers, you know your kids, don't you? <laughs> You know, you know your children. We're not given any information that Jesus had done any miracles prior to that time. As a matter of fact, uh, the Bible tells us this was his first miracle. We don't understand any of that, but, but Mary, because of her immaculate conception and because of, uh, because of her, her knowing her son, she, she, she had to know that, was, obviously, she knew there was something special about him. And so we're not quite sure why she went to him, but apparently she went to him thinking that he could solve this problem or help with this problem. And, and, and then this little transaction that takes place between the two of them is fascinating. And let's look at it for a minute. He said, you know, she said, uh, son, we, we, we run out of wine. And then he said to her, you know, uh, why does this thing that concern you or why should it concern me? And then he called her woman. <coughs> and then he told her, my time has not yet come. Now that phrase, woman, let's talk about that. I've called my wife that a few times, and if she slaps me or hits me or beats me up or something like that, you know, I'm always supposed to call her Miss Holly or something, you know. No. You know, we think of it as a derogatory term, as something of a put-down. Uh, but in reality, that was the same term that Jesus used for her when he was on the cross. You know, woman, behold thy son. That's what he told her. So let's not think of it as a put-down, but let's understand what was happening between Jesus and his mother at that time. Why should this thing of you concern me? Why should it apply to what I'm doing. It, my time has not yet come. My ministry is not, does not fit into any of this. Basically what he was saying to her was, um, I have to be doing what I have to be doing. I have to be on my mission. I have to be following my calling. The, the, the timetable I'm on, my time has not come. Uh, none of this matters from your vantage point, Mom. What he was really, what he was really wanting to help her to understand is, is that he was wanting her to move from thinking of him as a son to thinking of him as a savior. You see, she needed to make that transition. And and also, I think implied in this scripture is that I think God wanted us to see that Jesus. Obviously, he loved his mother. He honored his mother. But the mother of Jesus was simply one other person who became a follower of Jesus Christ. She was not a special person. She was not an extra godly person. She's, she is not to be put on any, any pedestal as on some equality with God. None of this was here. Jesus was wanting her to understand and us to understand that the mother of Christ the physical mother of Christ, simply needed to move from being his mother, although she was always his mother, but, but to, to move into a spiritual relationship with him. So that, that was a little transaction that took place between the two of them. But Jesus changed his mind. He did this often in Scripture. But quite, quite often someone would ask him to do something, and he would say, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to go here, or whatever. But then he would, he, he would seem to shift gears and, and do it when it fit what he wanted it to fit. And this is exactly what he did. But we, we see that Mary seemed to catch on that, hey, things are different now. Whenever she turned to the servants and, servants and said, whatever he tells you to do, you do. I could almost hear her almost saying, whatever my Lord tells you to do, you do. 
And so then we have a, an interesting picture, and I'm going to develop some of this with you a bit later. But we, we have the six stone jars that were used for, it said they were used for purification. <clears throat> the, the, the Jews at that time believed that the world that they were living in was defiled. It was defiled by the Romans. It was defiled by the Greeks. It was defiled by sin. And, and so they, they, worked, they really set a high premium on, on being pure before God. And so when it said those six jars were there, it probably meant there were a lot of people there. And, and, and what they would do is they would, they would go to the, whenever they would come in from the outside world, so to speak, then they would dip, the, they would dip their arms down up to their elbows and oh, they clean their hands, but they would also uh, ceremonially that was a ceremonial, ceremonial purification thing that they did. So there were those six jars that were there. Now, they also washed their uh, cooking utensils in there as well. So understand what, what was in those jars. Jesus told the servants, fill those jars up. And that's exactly what they did. And, and the, he, they filled the jars to the very brim. And then he said, draw out some water, draw some water, and take it to the chief servant. The chief servant was sort of like, uh, one time I was in a restaurant in New Orleans, and they just wore me out because I'd drink a little sip of water, and these people would run over and put a little more in. You know, I just said, leave me alone, let me eat, you know. But he was, he was the chief servant that, that just ran everything at the wedding. And so these servants, they took this water over to him and gave it to him. And, and John tells us that they knew where it came from, but no one else knew. And that's important to this story. They knew where it came from. And when he tasted it, it was delicious wine. It was good wine. And he had no idea where it came from. He just knew that it was much better than what they started with. And so he goes, he goes to the groom and asks him, you know, what's, what's the big idea? You're bringing out the best wine last. We have, we have traditionally un understood this story that the water in those six water pots was changed to wine. And that, that was that was where the you know that miracle took place. And that's a that is a beautiful understanding, and I'm not saying it is an incorrect understanding, but that is a beautiful understanding of that scripture. Because the, the miracle that happened was that Jesus took water and changed it to wine. Jesus took water and and, and did a miracle. And the, the, the meaning of wine in their you know, in, in their circumstance, was really threefold. It was tied to suffering. It was tied to celebration. And, and it, it, it was also just such, a, such an important part of their experience. And so, if we capture the, the, the meaning of this story, is... John the Baptist would have never been invited to that wedding because John the Baptist was rough. What was his message to the people? His message to the people was, repent. God's going to destroy you if you don't repent. You're a bunch of snakes. You know, very hard. <laughs> okay. But I don't I'm doing fine. I don't know about you. All right. So this 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 was where John the Baptist was saying, God is a God of judgment. God is a God that's going to come and and you know and literally judge you harshly. But I love what this miracle shows us. You know what the miracle this miracle shows us? Is Jesus, for his first public event, he goes to a party. He literally does. He goes to a celebration. He goes to a place where there was laughing, where there was dancing, where there was, uh, you know, just a lot of people having a great time. 
and, and by bringing the best wine to last, what he does is he makes the party even greater than it was when it started. See? Don't you see the contrast? And so what God is wanting us to understand, I believe one thing through this story is, yes, God is a God of judgment. Amen. Yes, he is. Amen. There is a heaven. There is a hell. There is a punishment for those who, don't, who are not obedient and not, not, not forgiven in their sins. It's a hard thing to say, but Jesus talked about it very explicitly. And I, I, wished, I wished it weren't so, but it is. Yeah. And there is, there is the judgment of God on, on sin in our lives. But there is also the grace of Jesus Christ. And there is also the fact that God is a God of judgment, but God is also a God of joy and peace yeah. and happiness. Yeah. And, and if, if Jesus were living today... He would be going to college football games, you know. He'd be doing all the fun stuff we do. He'd be going water skiing with you every time you went. That was a joke, water skiing. <laughs> uh, I was afraid that went over your head. You, you, un you understand the point. Jesus lived life to its fullest. He celebrated life. And, and I think that's a beautiful picture from this story that we can capture. Oh, and, and when, we, when we join him in heaven one of these days, you're talking about fun. Now, we're going to have fun. I mean, it's going to be great. I'm, I'm so excited about it. And so this is, what, this is what Jesus was saying. He was serious. And tonight, by the way, tonight we're going into the temple with him, and he's going to do some serious stuff in that temple. But this, this is what he was wanting us to, to see and understand in the message. Now, let me, uh, let me go to this verse. What is it? Uh, yeah, verse 11. I want to I wrap, wrap up our thinking with this. Because I, 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 I think this really brings out what this story is all about. By the way, this story was not for the wedding group. Now, they, they, they profited from it. But this story seems to have been done for those who were very much in the background. Who knew about the miracle? The servants. You know? And then, verse 11, what it says is, Jesus performed this first sign in Galilee, in Cana of Galilee, and then he displayed his glory, and his disciples believed on him. This miracle was done for his disciples who were there. Now, others saw it, perhaps, but apparently the reaction we have here is, what, what John tells us is, those who reacted were those close followers. He was beginning to take them on a journey of helping them to understand who he was and what he was about. And these four stories we're doing are doing that. And he was wanting them to begin, begin to understand who he was. Now, in light of this, let me give you a little bit different interpretation of how I think this story took place. Jesus had those six water pots filled. Now, what did they have in them? Water. What kind of water? Dirty water. You know, dirty water. It, was, it, it had scrub on the bottom, and it had dirty water in it. When Jesus said to the servants, Go draw out some water. The word that is used there for go draw out water is exactly the same word that is used when Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman and he, told, he was talking to her about drawing water out of a well. The same word. And some have said the real message behind this story is obviously it was a miracle. The miracle was a miracle. It was a marvelous thing. But those six water pots... He asked for them to be filled so that they could symbolically uh, represent an incomplete something. The number six was always incomplete in, in the Jewish thought. It was always sort of there, but not quite there. And those six water pots would represent the, the incomplete Jewish religion. And then what he told the servant was, you go draw water out of a source 
that is always replenishing a well, a source that always has clean water in it. In addition to that, the container you're going to use is going to be clean as well because it, it's used to pour water out. So you, you go there, you take the water from there, and, and the, the message that I believe, and I believe that's why this, this last scripture has such impact, that his disciples saw his glory and they believed on him. He was communicating to them and to us that these six water pots are the incomplete, incomplete experience of Judaism. And, I, and I'm going to fill them as full as I can. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to ignore them. I'm going to fill them as full, full as I can. But I am the seventh water pot. I am the seventh supply. And what I'm going to bring to you is, is joy and celebration. I'm, I'm going to bring the party alive. I'm going to bring goodness. I'm going to bring all of this into the world. So, this, I believe, is the real power of this story. Because in, in Jesus Christ, we find our completeness. You know? We do, don't we? Now, we, we struggle. We make mistakes. We're not perfect. We don't have complete understanding. You know, we're, we're human beings. But we find in, in Jesus Christ our completeness, don't you? Don't you? You find the, the fullness. When I accepted Jesus when I was 15 years old, it was like there was something inside of me that wasn't right that suddenly got turned right. And it's never been unturned ever since. Jesus completed me. And as you believed and trust in Jesus, trusted in Jesus Christ, he completed you. And that's where this peace and this joy comes from. And I, when, when, when Jesus came into my life and completed my life, I was so happy. I cried now. I swallowed like a baby. Because the, the joy was so full and the, the release from the guilt of sin was so awesome. But I was the happiest guy. If somebody had been having a party, I would have joined it. It was church, so they didn't have parties in church. But I would have joined it. So what do we have in Jesus? for you today and for me today is this affirmation that our lives are complete in him even though we have our imperfections and even though we have our struggles and I, I want you to I want you to have that positive influence from God's Word that Jesus is all you need Jesus can be your completion Jesus can be your fulfillment and you may be here today and you've 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 never had that you know, maybe you went to church. You know, maybe you even walked the aisle when you were younger. I don't know. You, you, you've never had that marvelous experience. You can have that today in Jesus Christ. He will complete you. He will make you all that you should be in him. Isn't that marvelous? Now we can have an amen, okay? Is that amen? Amen. 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 Marvelous story. I just love it. That Jesus wasn't just an old stick in the mud that never laughed. And, and I, I, I would just imagine, we, did, we don't have any of his jokes recorded in Scripture, but I'll bet you he can tell some good jokes. Don't you imagine? Because he, I, he, you know he loved to laugh. And the first public event he went to wasn't to go to Jerusalem where all the big mucky mucks were. And it wasn't to go where all the crowds were. His first public experience where he, where he displayed his glory was in an humble little town called Cana among folks just like you and me. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves you. My appeal to all of us today is if, if you're in a situation in your life to where there's some there's some struggles, there's some emptiness, there's some there's some issues you're dealing with, uh, whatever. What I want you to know is that Jesus wants to be every bit 
your God and your Lord and your Savior. And as a Christian, I'm saying that to you as a believer. Because sometimes we get in, in a situation to where uh, we, we, we forget how, how much he wants to be a part of our lives and how much he wants to fill our lives and complete our lives. But I also offer to you, if, if you're here, you've never opened your heart and life to Jesus Christ and just said, Lord, I, just, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to come so we, can, so we can party together, so we can love together, so we can serve together. I offer that time to you, and I'm, I'm going to be standing down in front in just a few moments. Uh, you may be here looking for a church home, and we would certainly encourage you. This is a wonderful, warm group of folks. I look forward to coming down here. Wish I lived closer to you. But this will be a place where God may want to use you as well. However God would speak to you. We're going to have a word of prayer and offer a time of invitation. Amen. Would you pray with me? Thank you so much, Lord, for this marvelous story. That you would, that you would just have fun with people and party with people and, and bring celebration into their lives. And Lord, you've done that for us as we trusted in you. So Lord, I, I, I pray that you will just help us to recall the joy, uh, the happiness. And Father, if it's been missing in our lives that as Christians, that you will just help us to reclaim that and know how much you want to love us. And Father, I would pray if there's anyone here and they've never opened their heart and life to you, that, that in these moments, so I'd love to, to talk with them in these moments, they would just open their lives to you. However you lead us, Lord, this is our time with you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.